Good morning, church family. Good morning. Ashley, I just have one question for you. How many times have you done that invitation that this is my husband, Connor? <laughs> How long have you been married? One month. One month. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It is such a privilege to be here with you. Uh, I want to do my one moment commercial here before we begin. Southwestern Adventist University exists because you do. Now I know you're our next door neighbors, but I am so thankful. Can I just see by a raise of hands of how many people in here have attended or have uh, paid for someone to attend Southwestern Adventist University? Can I see your hand? Ah, look at that, look at that. Our attending now, amen. I wish I saw that in every church I visited, right? That that would be the response. And so, uh, Dr. Schwartz, thank you for that children's story. Again, one of our professors. Your pastor. Both your pastors, right? <laughs> We're so excited about that. And I want to thank you, too, for what you have done with student pastors here. Um, you have helped to mentor these young men and women, and I thank you very much. You extend our classroom, and it has been a great experience. And so I just thank you for... Uh, Believing that Jesus is coming soon, and in doing that, you're helping to train and develop these young folks. And Marlene is one of our graduates that's coming here to teach. And there's several of your teachers here, too, that are our graduates. When Pastor Powell called me earlier in the week, he said, I want to do a, a series on prayer. And so uh, I have the privilege here to sort of kick things off for him a little bit today. And that's what we're going to be looking at, is this privilege of prayer. Would you bow your heads with me for just a moment? Our Father, as we do what we're getting to talk about, I just ask that you would open our hearts, that we will see in new ways how much you love us and the privilege it is for us as sinful human beings to come into your presence and find your grace to help in time of need and the strength to stand and live for you where we live. I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to suggest to you today that if we're going to talk about praying, that the first thing we need to learn is how to mumble. There's no way that we'll ever know how to pray without knowing how to mumble. Uh, I'm not saying that the Bible does. Open your Bibles with me to the place that... Uh, uh, Pastor Schwartz referred to the book of Psalms. You see, there are places you can uh, study about prayer, but really in the book of Psalms, what you're doing is you're eavesdropping. You're listening to people pray. Now, I was born and raised in rural West Virginia, Appalachia country. And some of you here may know what I'm talking about, but when I was a kid growing up, we had a party line telephone. Anybody know what a, oh, I see some old folks out here like me. Party line telephone. And I remember when I was a kid, our ring was four, four longs and a short. But as little kids, that's the ones we were least interested in. We liked to pick that thing up and listen in. And we'd pick that up and listen in and somebody would say, I think those kids are on the line. We'd hang up real quick. We were scared because I knew what my mom would do. She caught us. But it was so much fun to eavesdrop, to listen. And that's what I'm inviting you to do today. Would you open your Bibles? Many people believe that the book of Psalms, Psalms 1 is not just the first Psalm. It's an introduction to the whole book of Psalms. Psalms is a book of prayer. We're eavesdropping. We're listening in. Notice if you would in Psalms 1, verse 1. You know this passage by heart. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the wicked, or stands in the way of sinners, or sets in the seat of the mocking. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. Now, Hebrew is not a language I understand very well. And so I've talked with uh, those in my department who do. And they tell me that that word meditate right there, in Hebrew literally means to mumble mumble. You see, the concept is this, of mumbling, is that you're speaking to God about what's on your heart. Uh, 
Dr. Schultz, that's what you were talking about, this honesty. And my mom doesn't have eyes in the back of her head, but she knows me, doesn't she? And that, that word mumble means to speak to God about what's on your heart. And secondly, it means to speak audibly. The Psalms were songs. God knew a long time ago that history can be preserved through music. And we're gonna see in just a moment, we're gonna look at a Psalm. We're gonna listen to someone mumble. And watching and listening to them maybe can teach us how to mumble in prayer. Would you open your Bibles with me to Psalms 73? Not every Psalm was written by David. Psalms 73, if you'll turn there, was written by a man named Asaph. Psalms 73. Now we need to take just a moment and find out who Asaph really was. So keep your finger right here. Psalm 73 is where we're going. But would you turn back to 1 Chronicles? We're in Psalm 73. You're keeping your finger there. And you're turning back to 1 Chronicles. Notice if you would, we're looking. Who in the world is Asaph that is mentioned here uh, in this passage? And in uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 16. 1 Chronicles chapter 15 and verse 16 says this. Are we there? <laughs> David told the leaders of the Levites to appoint their brothers as singers. To sing what kind of songs? I like that. Joyful songs. Accompanied by musical instruments, the lyre, the harp, the cymbal. And look at verse 17. So he appointed Levites, uh, so the Levites appointed Heman, son of Joel, and from his brother, who? Asaph. Evidently, there were Levites that their responsibility was not simply in handling the furniture of the sanctuary and carrying on the rites. Some Levites were appointed to music, to sing. And Asaph seems to be one of those. Would you look in chapter 16 of 1 Chronicles? Something else it says about him in verse 7. 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 7. That day, David first committed to Asaph and his associates this psalm of thanks to the Lord. Evidently, David, when he wrote some of these psalms, would ask the singers to teach them to the people. That in these songs, they could capture the history, could capture the praise and worship of God. And that was Asaph's responsibility. He was to teach and lead in the music in the sanctuary. Would you notice verse 37? Still in 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 37, it says this. David left Asaph and his associates before the ark of the covenant of the Lord to minister there, how often? Continually. Continually? Regularly. That was Asaph's responsibility. Every day, he's in the sanctuary. Every day, he's leading the praise in the sanctuary. It's his responsibility. Would you come back with me to Psalm 73? <clears throat> I want you to remember now that you have picked up the receiver, that you're eavesdropping. This is Asaph now, mumbling, speaking to God about what's on his heart. Would you notice Psalm 73, verse 1? Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. We can say amen, can't we? Amen. But you see, the Hebrews do something a little different than we do. Many times, we always end with a conclusion. You'll find in many of the Psalms, they start with a conclusion and tell you how they got there. And notice what he says, that God is good to Israel, to those who are of a pure heart, but in verse 2. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I nearly lost my foothold. How in the world could a person that's been appointed by God to be in part of the worship service and lead the music how in the world could that person say, you know, there was a time I almost turned my back on all of it. 
my foot almost slipped. What would cause a person to do that? To turn their back on the things that they've been taught to believe in, the way they were raised. Notice, if you would, verse 3. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. You see, here's this man every day coming into the sanctuary. But on his way there, he sees those in the streets and those he passes seem to be dressed a little better than him. Getting around on a little better horse or chariot or some way, it just seems like what they have is more than what he has. And once you notice something, he said, I envied. You know what envy means? <laughs> you know, the palms sweat. Heart beats a little faster. Hey, you're thinking, I, I, I wish, you know. Don't want anybody to know, but I wish. I envy the arrogant. And I want you to notice in this Psalms, here again, David is opening his heart to God as a friend. He's mumbling. Asaph is. Please don't criticize him. Listen to him. Maybe it would affect us in our mumbling. Would you notice what he says in verse 4? What do the wicked look like? What's their appearance? Notice in verse 4. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They're free from the burdens common to man. They are not plagued by human ills. If I didn't know better, I'd swear that somewhere back in his house, he had HBO, Cinemax, and Showtime, right? Because where do you get this picture of wickedness? No problems. Healthy, strong. Do you see that picture? They don't have any burdens. You know, MasterCard, take me away. <laughs> they have everything they ever want. That's what the wicked look like to him as he's on his way to work in the sanctuary. Would you look at the attitude of the wicked? Look in verse 6. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their calloused hearts comes iniquity. The evil conceits of their minds know no limits. They scoff and speak with malice, and in their arrogance, they threaten oppression. And look in verse 9. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. They got it all. Asa said that they're strutting their stuff. They're not walking around as he's been taught to be humble. They're walking around strutting what they are and who they are and what they got. Be careful. Asa said, I envied them. Their appearance, their attitude. Look at this. How about their appeal to others? Look, if you would, in verse uh, 10. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how can God know? Does the most holy have knowledge? You see, not only does Asaph envy them, there are other people looking at them saying, I wish I could be like that too. They have everything that I want. I know it was like about 40 years ago starting to pastor in a little church in West Virginia. Some Sabbath mornings you could shoot off a shotgun and not hit anybody out there, you know? My wife and I go to the mall at night and there by the movie theater there'd be a line all the way out the door. Those people are paying to come, right? Isn't that something? Can't get them to come to church. There they are lined up for that. Don't you think Asa didn't feel that a little bit? You know, the, the, the people not looking to him as their mom. Ah, it's, it's, it's the famous of the day. <laughs> it's those with honor and prestige and ability who wear the bling. Are you with me? They're the ones that people look at. Verse 12, this is what the wicked are like. This is from people looking at them. They're always carefree, and they increase in wealth. Huh. Now, come on. Don't tell me you haven't heard the voice of Asaph in your own heart. As you look at some of those things that we see every day, is there ever any envy 
wondering why I don't have some maybe of the finer things in life when I look at them and they seem to have no problem. This bothered Asaph tremendously. In fact, let him tell you at the agony. Look in verse 12. This is what the wicked are like. They're always carefree. They're increased in wealth. Verse 13. Surely what? In vain have I kept my heart pure. In vain I have washed my hands of innocence. I have been good for nothing. These folks could care less about God and his ways. And they have it all. I try to live a faithful life. And I have nothing. And he says, those times I wonder if it's been worth it. I'm not saying this. I'm reading it. Are you with me? Yeah. I don't know if we'd ever have the courage to speak to God like this. To tell him that's what's on our heart. That's called mumbling. Things are not fair. Asaph doesn't like it. His heart is not in tune with the things of God. Uh, can you imagine what that would be like to go to work every day? Well, let him tell you. Notice the next verse. 14, all day long I have been plagued. Here's his morning devotion. I have been punished every morning. <laughs> Look what else he says. Verse 15, if I had said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed your children. You know, if I had stood up in church and said, listen, it's not worth it. I can see Asaph as he's leading the music that maybe there's some young boys sitting in there with their father and they're seeing what Asaph is doing and, and maybe some little boy, he can see them pointing up towards Asaph, telling his father, someday I'd like to be like him. And Asaph said, if I said what was on my heart, what damage it would do to our children. I want to tell you something. If I had prayer right now and went home, this would be discouraging, wouldn't it? But that's what's in this man's heart. That's how he feels. That's how he views the world he lives in. But I'm so thankful for verse 17 in the very first word. What is that word? Until. <laughs> you mean there's hope? Until. Notice what it says. Until I entered the sanctuary of God. And then I understood their final destiny. Now, wait a minute. We read a moment ago that this man goes into the sanctuary. How often? Every day. Continually. But do you mean to tell me that one time he didn't just attend. He worshipped. He had that aha experience, right? You know, before, you know, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saves a wrench like you. <laughs> But now, now things have changed. Handling the things of God, but he'd lost the significance of them. And one day he realized that there's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath the tide, lose all their guilty stains. One day he did not attend, he worshiped. It makes all the difference in the world. Prayer will change your worship service. You know that? Prayer will change your personal life when you have learned to mumble, to speak to God about what's on your heart, to be honest with him. And when you do that, something happens. I want you to notice the next half of this psalm. There has been a paradigm shift. Circumstances haven't changed. The way he walked to church hasn't changed. His financial status, nothing has changed. But there's been a tremendous change when he enters the sanctuary. I want to suggest something to you. The world looks different when you look at it through the word. Are you with me? The world looks different through the word. You see, <coughs> when he went into the sanctuary, that's where he saw the images of what God was like. For us today, when we go into his word... We enter his sanctuary. We enter that time with him. It changes our perspective on the world and how we see it. You saw in your little bulletin that quote from Desire of Ages. Those couple chapters there, the invitation 
and peace on the storm. Uh, this quote is taken from there. When every other voice is hushed. You see that on the part of your bulletin. And in the quietness we wait before him. The silence makes more distinct the voice of God. Do you know that his routine was getting in the way of his worship? <laughs> Couldn't hear God. But I want you to see that one day he, he had that aha experience where he began to realize that these precious things that he's been surrounded with, they have a meaning in his life. They affect how I look at the world. Would you notice what the Bible says? Look, if you would, in verse 18. Surely you've placed them on slippery. Now, wait a minute. This psalm started out and he said, I almost slipped. But look at what he's saying now. Their feet are on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. You see, I want you to notice that the world looks different through the word. He sees the world differently. How suddenly, verse 19, they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors, and as a dream when one awakes, so when you see, when you arise, O Lord, you will despise them as fantasy. All of a sudden he sees that the world is not real. And I want to tell you something. I get nervous when people want to call this reality, right? And this a myth. Are you with me? I want to tell you something. If you want to know how to be a man or a woman, it's not here, it's here, right? And Ashley and Connor and others, if you want to know how to be a husband and wife, it's here, not here. The world looks different through the word. And I was like something to you whenever I feel that appeal and that envy and that draw away, usually it's because I'm not spending the time I should in the Word. Are you with me? The word, world looks different through the Word. Not only that, he sees himself different through the Word. Notice what it says. Verse 21. When my heart was grieved and I, my spirit embittered. You see, that's what happens when you try to walk in two places. When you say that you're a Christian but your heart is somewhere else, you know what? You're going to end up bitter. You ever met any bitter people like that? Yeah, they're trying to walk two paths. You can't do it. He says here, my spirit was embittered. In verse 23, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Oh, Lord, thank you, he says. How dumb I was to think that the answer is there. It's outside your will. He said, I dodged a bullet. <laughs> I almost did something stupid. Listen to me, church. Asaph's not the only one that's ever stood on that cliff, is he? Praise God if you know him as your Lord and Savior. And tonight you can lay down and sleep with a clean heart. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Amen. To know forgiveness. And no, it's not that we're perfect. But that you know a God that you can confess those sins. Uh, you don't have those skeletons in the closet that you're hiding from everyone else. God has thrown them into the depths of the sea. Amen? Amen. He's cleansed you. Amen. You walk down the street, you can look people in the eye. God has made you whole. Asaph says, I see myself differently. But here's what broke his heart. Is verse 23. He sees God differently. Yet I'm always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You see, when I was doing the half-hearted, foolish service, God, you were full-time pulling. God is always wooing our hearts. Do you believe that? He's not going to be satisfied till he has all of you. You will be miserable <laughs> until you give him all. I think the most miserable people in the world are not the sinners we say living in sin. I think it's the folks sitting in church wishing they were living in sin. Most miserable people in the world. But I am so thankful that the Holy Spirit continues to work on our hearts when we open our heart to God as a friend. That we speak to him. That we're not satisfied with just attending. We want to worship. And then these next two verses are powerful. This is from the heart. Whom have I in heaven but you? 
The earth has nothing I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may feel, fail, but God is my strength and my heart and my portion forever. Don't you want that to be your prayer? I'm here to tell you folks that there's nobody like Jesus that can bring peace to your heart and purpose to your step. And I really believe that, that when we are not worshiping him, he misses us. He's there with us, but he misses because he knows it can be so much more. I'll finish, but I was teaching at Shenandoah Valley Academy about 30 years ago, and we had a little house there on campus. Really, there was a main highway that separated my house from campus, but it was very, very close. And uh, I had two little daughters at that time. They're grown now, married and gone. And, but at that time, they were just little girls. And so in the morning, uh, Michelle, my oldest at that time, was going into first grade. And so we'd walk down that long driveway past those other houses on the same street because we had to cross that main street. Then once we were on campus, she could walk over to the elementary school. So I would walk her down there, and we came to that road, I'd, I'd hold on to her hand, you know. She thinks she's holding on to mine, right? But I'm holding on to hers. And if we're in a hurry, I just pick her up by her feet and all, and we, you know, you know how that is. Because the strength is in my hold, not hers. And I would, I'd bring her across that road. And I remember one day, um, we're coming home, and I'm coming up that little highway. Michelle is with me. But the end of the, that road right up there where our house was, I, I see my wife. And she's sort of frantic. There's a neighbor with her as well. And they're both just sort of frantic around. And I get a little closer and Leslie says to me, I can't find Meredith. I said, what do you mean you can't? I can't find Meredith. She's, she's about three, four years old at this time. She said, I can't find Meredith. I said, I mean, there's this highway running right by our house. There's a ditch. But I go in the house and I'm in her room, Meredith! We had a big old basement down there, a bunch of stuff. Meredith! Out behind our house, huge cornfield. Kids would play back there. Meredith! Nothing. I, I went out by that road to look down in that ditch. The neighbor said that the, her little girl was playing. Both of them were playing together. And I, I thought how easy it would be for a car going down that highway to stop and just pick those little girls up. I remember walking down that, that sidewalk, Meredith, no answer. I'm here to tell you, it's one of the most frightening feelings I will never forget in my life to be calling for this child and there's no answer. I get back down to about the end of the road, then up there I hear my wife again. There's all this excitement. It's my wife and the neighbor. And I go up there, and I see these two little girls standing up there. And, ah, oh, it's Meredith and her friend. And I, I see my wife hugging her. And then, don't you ever do that. You know, this type of thing. Uh, her and her little friend had gotten behind a bush and decided to play hide-and-go-seek. But they didn't tell us. So every time I'd call her name, they'd be behind that bush. God misses you if you're not in his presence every day. He's calling. He misses you. And so today, I just want to challenge you. Go home. If God has spoken to your heart today, maybe he's not finished. Go home. Look Psalm 73 up. Look at some of these other Psalms. Open them up. All the emotions of life are in the book of Psalms. I want to challenge you Speak to God about what's on your heart. That's where prayer begins, isn't it? Even if you're mad and frustrated, whatever it may be, speak to God about what's on your heart. When you do, God speaks back to you. He clears up our sights. He helps us to see life as it truly is. I'm thankful today that we can learn to mumble, aren't you? Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me as we pray? I think we have a, do we have a closing song? We do. This is a dismissal song. Everyone knows it? All right, somebody, Sharon, come and lead it for us, if you would.
make an appeal this morning because the moment we have an adversary that can take our eyes off Jesus and put them on ourselves, there's nothing more discouraging. Nothing will frustrate you more. And not only does that happen, but you see, God has created you for good works. Isn't that what the Bible says in Ephesians? He, he has, there, it says beforehand, He has created, that there's something God has called that you don't even know yet. Everything He's called you to do. And the only way, the only way you can be prevented from doing that is for your eyes to go off Jesus. That's all the adversary has to do. Just get our eyes off Jesus. And we become discouraged and self-centered and we can't see the world clearly. This world needs Christians that know the Lord, that will share with them this love. But if I'm walking around with a pity party for myself, frustrated about the way life is for me, I'll never care about how it is for you. Is that making sense today? I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray that if Asaph has been here today, that God will bring deliverance to him just again, that until, that, that there will be that aha experience today that I'm going to turn my eyes on Jesus and I'm going to allow him to bless in my life that I can be a blessing to others. Would you bow your heads with me? Father in heaven, I thank you for your word that you placed in scripture that we can read and see that you know our hearts and understand us. You, you handle us so gently. But Father, we get ourselves into such binds when we forget that our hope is in you and in nothing less. Lord, today, if there have been some that came into this room as Asaphs, I pray that they'll leave it today redeemed, that they will know that they'll never be happy until their lives are surrendered to you, that we'll speak to you about what's on our heart. Be honest with that. And then allow you to clear our vision and change our hearts that we love the things you love. So will you bless today this congregation and with every head bowed and just simply if there's those here that say, Lord, do that to me, would you just put your hand up? Nobody's looking. Saying, Lord, I, amen, God sees those hands. My hand is there as well. Lord, use these hands for your kingdom's sake. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.